how did you pick yourself up whenever you started to kind of get down on your luck again? It was just constant affirmation that this is all meant to be Mm. and going back to that I know it's kind of a spiritual message for some but for me it really sticks of like I'm meant to be struggling right now I'm meant to not know what it is and the time will come and I think another beautiful thing is I had never really known what my passion was so it wasn't that abnormal of a feeling I knew that the backup option was I can work at a grocery store and make money if I need to or this tea place right here I will be fine and my best case scenario is finding out what I want to do and be passionate about it and doing it and that's what happened Mm -hmm. and it was just beautiful that it unfolded in that way hello my friends welcome to it's all magic I am your guide your host and your friend Devin Hine and here we'll be discussing how to make your life truly feel like magic I believe that our very existence on earth is nothing less than a miracle and that we all have so much potential to learn, to grow, to experience, and to create during our short time here. It is both my passion and my pleasure to walk this path of life optimization by your side, where we'll discuss topics like passion, purpose, intuition, manifestation, physical well-being, and much, much more. I'm a yoga teacher, a meditation and breathwork facilitator, and a national board certified health and wellness coach. But more importantly, I am an eternal optimist, a lover of life, and a forever student. It is my hope that with each and every episode, you too will finally start to believe it really is all magic after all. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another super fun episode of It's All Magic. You are definitely in luck because today I have one of my best friends in the entire world on the show. Her name is Sabrina Kinney, and she is a plant-based recipe content creator on Instagram at Plant Forward Sabrina. But she is also a multi-passionate, eternally curious soul. She loves all things pickleball, board games, plant-based food, travel, and just the enjoyment of life. She inspires me in so many ways, and I have no doubt that she will inspire you through this conversation as well. We touch on so many topics from her spiritual journey, plant-based nutrition and the health benefits of eating more plants on your plate, her relationship with her amazing fiance and how they're able to navigate having different religious beliefs and different eating patterns and so much more. So if any of that sounds interesting, definitely stay tuned because we have a really fun conversation coming in just a moment. But before we get started with the conversation, I of course want to grant us the opportunity to take a few deep breaths. Let's keep it really simple today and just breathe in through the nose and then sigh it out through the mouth. Sometimes I like to go back to the foundations of taking deep breaths. It doesn't always have to be complicated. In fact, I feel like that was one of my takeaways from today's conversation. So when you're ready, if you'd like to close your eyes, you're more than welcome. And if you don't have the opportunity to close your eyes, that's okay too. I just want you to get yourself ready. If you are sitting down, maybe get yourself comfortable. And then all together, you can empty out from your previous breath. And then breathe in through the nose, filling up all the way. And open mouth, just let it go. (sighs) Gorgeous. And again, inhale through the nose. And open mouth, sigh it out. (sighs) Last one, make it the deepest and fullest yet. Inhale, breathe it all in. And open mouth, let it all go. (sighs) Ah, ah. Gorgeous. You can flutter open your eyelids and get excited about this conversation. And without further ado, let's get into it. Enjoy, my friends. I will see you on the other side. Hello, and welcome back to another amazing episode of It's All Magic. I am very, very excited about today's episode, as always, because I am joined by one of my dearest friends in the entire world, 
Sabrina Kinney. Hi, Sabrina. Hello. <laughs> How it's are great you? to be here. How are my you own feeling? House. This is your first podcast you've ever been on. How are you feeling in this very moment? It feels exciting. You know, there's yeah. a lot of setup for this. A lot of and setup. And I'm really excited to be here in this moment, reaping the benefits of the setup. I'm, I'm so glad. I hope we're reaping the benefits. For anyone listening or watching, you should know that the setup for a podcast is half of the battle. I think this is a great thing for people to learn. I don't think we should talk about anything else. We should just talk about <laughs> the setup. <laughs> what people the magic of setting up a podcast. Exactly. Well, speaking of magic, my dear friend, I don't know if you know it, that this question is coming to you, but I've been doing this thing where I start every interview with the same question. So the question is this, for you, what makes life feel like magic? Uh, you know, I did remember you saying this. I love of them. That. And I was like, oh, I should think of something totally, totally missed. That's always how it works. But I think that's a good thing. Uh, magic to me is the random things that come up that make you smile. So oh. it's seeing uh, a buy one, get one free ice cream sign and going into the ice cream store. <gasps> And getting that local ice cream as an example. That's the cutest answer. <laughs> I wish everyone in the audience could know you and meet you because you are the epitome of spontaneous, playful adventures. Oh, you, you are such a kid mm -hmm. in an adult body. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> teen adult. <laughs> a teen adult, you could yeah. say. And I just really appreciate that that's also what makes life feel like magic for you. I mean, isn't it? D do you relate to that at all? A 100%. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to think of another example. If it's not the ice cream store, it's it would like be... It's like you're on a walk and then you see the sun setting and you decide to go down to the beach and watch the sun setting. That's the It's best. like capturing... I guess it's more being in the present moment and being aware of your surroundings and yeah. then acting on it instead of being like, oh, that would be nice. Absolutely. It's, I will do that right now. Absolutely. Oh, that's so fun. Would you put buying a spontaneous international plane ticket because you see a good deal in an email in the same boat. You know, it, it does make life more magical when it does. you do that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Fantastic answer. Great start to the podcast. I'm so glad. So before we even dive into some of the topics that mm -hmm. I want to discuss, I feel like it might be fun to kind of walk down memory lane through our friendship a bit. I love that. This is because great. so many people out there I know must relate to the whole adult friendships can be hard or how do you make friends? How do you maintain friendships when life is busy or you don't live in the same place as you did with your college friends, for example? Yeah. And I feel like we could both talk a little bit about our friendship, how we maintain it when we've yeah. lived long distance most of the time. Mm -hmm. And in general, you were like the greatest friend I don't mean just to me but like as mm. an archetype of a person uh. you are an amazing friend so let's start real quick with yep. how we met do you remember how we met you know we went to high school together yes and I don't remember the exact moment that we met I feel like I remember you being a grade younger than I was and as soon as I got into Northwestern you were like so excited mm -hmm. and then when it was your senior year and I was already there you were like really excited to learn more about it but did we meet before that was there anything before that no okay so this was okay cool. yes what I remember is being really interested in Northwestern and mm -hmm. I knew you went there I'd never met you I just kind yeah. of saw you in the halls mm -hmm. and so I spontaneously Facebook messaged you mm -hmm. and said my mom and I are coming to Chicago yeah to see Northwestern can you give us a tour and I was like I love this school I yes. love having people from our high school like visit this is awesome yes and you guys came in on Valentine's I Day I know and you guys were in a car where the driver gave you guys flowers yes and you guys gave me a flower and I was like this is the best Valentine's Day ever this is the best start to this and it was in Chicago like 20 degrees all of us from California just in our parkas walking around this campus and I'm like this is not she's not gonna love it here like this is terrible weather I am not doing a great job selling this and we just kept walking around and I loved hanging out with your mom too it was yes. just like the three of us being friends and the first time I met you or spent time with you was with your mom who is mm -hmm. so core to you and at Northwestern which is so core to me yes. uh, and then it was just us going on a walk which is funny because we do that all the time all the time <laughs> yes I still remember it was 
the coldest weather I had ever experienced in my life that night. So because we walked around for hours outside and it was a blast, when my mom and I got back to my hotel room, I had to sit in a scalding bath for two hours just to stop shivering. Mm -hmm. That's also, folks, it shows you how bad I am at regulating my own body temperature, (laughs) but that's a separate note. (laughs) Yeah, I, I remember what I loved about you and your mom is the energy that you had, the ability to be completely vulnerable right away the questions you asked were intelligent it felt like you did your research on what you wanted to learn about the school but also wanted to get to know me more and through that we talked about like boys and just like random things on the first day of meeting each other and like hanging out with each other that it's so cool to think back to that as the core foundation where we were so open immediately yeah and now what 10 years ish later yeah 10 years later we're here and we talk about the same things (laughs) and we are still very vulnerable with each other but it's cool that it started out that way absolutely so from there to where we are today let's talk a little bit about just the journey of the friendship and mainly how we've been able to maintain it because Mm -hmm. I do think as I mentioned especially for adults that are used to you know, the kinds of relationships you can have in college or even when you're younger, where you are living life with your friends day in, day out. It's like you go to the same dance practice or you have the same classes, live in the same dorm, and then real adult life hits. And it's not like that. Yeah. So how do you feel like we've been able to maintain our friendship so well? Yeah. Just through the years. First, it's the intentionality of a friendship that we both prioritize. Yeah. Because it's easy when you're in proximity to people, like in your college dorm, and you live right next to them, and then you do stuff with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And now, we've never really lived, for maybe like two years, we lived in the same city out of this 10-year friendship. I'm just calling it 10 years. I don't know. Something like that. And now, we have just so much of that foundation, but then also the intentionality of we want to put this friendship first and I think one of it it stems from I feel like the second or third time that we like really seriously talked uh I was in college you were in college and you were in this women's group and program and you texted me this super sweet message where it was like you are a role model to me I just wanted to let you know like we're supposed to reach out to these people say that they inspire us and I was so touched by that because we had not talked for more than like a few hours at that point in time in our lives but the intentionality that you put in letting me know how you felt and the vulnerability I think just opened the doors of our friendship even more so I mean that's kind of off topic but the idea is you need to continue to be vulnerable with Mm. the person even if you're in a distance friendship you need to tell them things and it's not like you're catching up with someone like we don't really sit around a table and be like what did you do Thursday like how was that (laughs) we we do that to start and then we get into but that made me feel this way and then I journaled about this and then I went on this walk and I had this epiphany yes and I think that is the magic totally. of the friendship where it gets to that deeper level. But I think communication can mean different things for different people. I think in adult friendships, you do not need to be in constant communication. Right. I think there's this mutual understanding that we both prioritize the friendship and yes. it's a top thing that we focus on but it's not something that we we don't text each other every day we text each other like maybe once a week or when something happens or to wish each other good luck in something that's coming up and I love that but it's mostly just a call like we call each other once every 10 ish days maybe for like two hours (laughs) and we catch up on everything and anything under the sun and continue (laughs) to talk about things that we are marinating on yeah but for the most part our friendship is those two hours of time where we're both on a walk which we love doing Mm -hmm. in separate cities and we're both talking about our feelings which we both love in separate (laughs) cities and so I it's not even a FaceTime it's not even me seeing your face right so I think the magic and the beauty of this adult friendship is we both have that understanding that no matter what we're there for each other we don't need to be in constant communication so it never feels draining I love all of that first of all I did not know that I you sent don't you that remember message that you sent that? I don't remember that. I do remember getting kind of challenges like that, you know, to yeah. reach out to someone that really inspires you. But I also, it's so beautiful hearing that it had that impact on you. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. So I feel like for anyone listening, they should, everyone listening should everyone reach listening. out <laughs> to someone that inspires you, someone that has supported you in the past, 
and just let them know what they mean to you. Apparently, it can really have an impact. Absolutely. I think it's great to be on the receiving end of those. And I'm sure it feels great to be on the sending end of those too. Yes, totally. I also love that you said that communication looks different for everyone and that you don't have to be in constant contact because... I think for me, especially as I was kind of transitioning from kind of childhood friendships to adult friendships, there is that loss of, wow, we used to be together, text every single day. It's just different. And then suddenly it's more of living parallel lives that you can talk about and update each other on constantly, but you're not necessarily making the day-to-day memories you once did. But it's nice to remember that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different phase of life. Agreed. And I also love that you brought up that we, when we spend time together, even though we are long distance, we're doing something we love, which Mm -hmm. is walking and talking. We also love that. (laughs) And you kept emphasizing vulnerability that Mm -hmm. even if it's been two weeks, three weeks, sometimes if you've been out of the country or something since we've talked, it's like, how are you? Like, what are your most recent epiphanies in your relationship, in your career? Mm -hmm. We go so deep. And we also then end up being that that rock for each other of like, oh, there's this thing I really need her coaching on. Yeah. Because we're not afraid to go really deep, really fast. And another point to that is one of the first questions we always ask each other, which you've taken like coaching classes. So maybe this is something (laughs) that you've learned and maybe I picked it up from you is what's top of mind for you. Mm. And that just opens the door. Yeah. I love hearing that because to me, it's like, what's your big priority right now? Yeah. What are you focusing on? What's taking up your brain space? Yes. And then we dive into so much from that. So if you don't know how to start <laughs> a tougher conversation or a more vulnerable conversation, I think that's a great opening line. What's top of mind? What are you thinking about right now? I, oh, that's such a great nugget of wisdom. When I was taking my coaching classes, there's this one opening line they taught us and yeah. Cal and I used to crack up about it. I want to see if you also think it's a little odd. The question that we were supposed to ask our clients for the first question of each session was, I can barely even say it. So Sabrina. (laughs) I'm your client right now. You have to be serious. It's so ridiculous. So Sabrina, what's new and good? No. Oh, gosh. It's too casual when you're not trying to be casual. Well, also... New and Does good? that mean it has to be both new and good? What if there's something that's new that's bad? Or what if there's something that's good that's old? <laughs> <laughs> the more you dive in, the weirder it it's is. such a bad question. But I think it taught me to at least start with just an open-ended, like, what's up? What's going on? Hey, way to see the positive in that what's question. What's new and good, Sabrina? <laughs> I'm now only going to say that when we talk. Oh my gosh. Anyway. Or, or maybe we can, what's uh, new and bad this week? Exactly. I should start what's our new next and one tough? call with that. What's new and tough? What's old and bad too? And we're only going negative now. That's exactly. the takeaway. It well, was I too think, positive for us. It's funny. I do think that's why they had the good thing. They yeah. said especially in life coaching, wellness coaching, they want you to get the client in the mindset um. of things are good so even if you had set wellness goals that they had fallen off track of if you say like hey what's going well with your wellness this week as your first question they might say oh well I actually did go to the gym it wasn't the five times I wanted to but I went three times I like that and suddenly they see it through a more rose-colored lens I do like that a lot maybe there are new and good things we can take from that question exactly I agree completely so transitioning into a whole new topic okay. I feel like that was a whole a, new and good topic I hope. yeah I feel like that new and good question really was the cherry on top of our little friendship discussion I want to talk a little bit about your career and Mm. your massive life pivot because Mm. the last year plus a few months has been life-changing for you in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So let's go back in time for a second to November of 2022. Mm -hmm. I hope I have that date right. You crushed it. What happened, Sabrina, (laughs) in November of 2022 that drastically changed the trajectory of your career? Yeah, I... uh, So... 
Starting out four and a half years about after graduating, I have been constantly working in tech corporate jobs, similar to your last job. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed what I was doing. I loved the people I was working with, but I was like, ultimately, this isn't for me. I don't know when I'm going to leave, but at some point in time, I know that this will not be my future career path. And so I was part of the layoffs in November of 2022. And immediately when I got the email, I was so excited. <laughs> yes, the classic reaction. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, they're paying me to not work for a few months. I was so fortunate to get so much severance. And I no longer have to worry about when I'm going to leave, what's going to happen here. Instead, I can just figure out what the heck I want to do with my life, which when you're working a job that you enjoy, but you're still working eight hours a day, it's hard to think and conceptualize doing something else or figuring out what you're actually passionate about totally so it was like the last day of November and that day I just went on some walks of course and was sad about a chapter ending but excited about a whole new world of possibilities and so I had four months where I didn't need to financially worry about anything and I could explore and be a kid in a playground with the world as my playground yeah. and so I went home for the holidays which was great I started playing a ton of pickleball which I still do today and love so I guess building you long-term and my mom. habits, it's great. Uh, and my 67-year-old partner there, it's yes. great. <laughs> and then I traveled. So I booked a three-week solo trip and I went to Italy. I had never been to Florence, but I loved that it was a quaint little city and I loved that it was near Tuscany. For some reason, I had always dreamed of working on a Tuscan farm. So I found this farmer through Woof, which is a fantastic program where it's kind of like Airbnb, but for farms and people people where you can lend your manual labor and they will give you a place to stay and food to eat while you're there. So I was in Florence for a few days and then I went to work on this olive orchard and vineyard in the Tuscan countryside with this farmer Guido. And so I was working with Guido uh, for about five or six days and we did anything from building a vineyard from scratch. Like we were hammering in poles and building this line system and structure for new vines of grapes to be made. So it was really cool to see in a day your hard work, super different than on a computer in a tech job, typing away at emails or in meetings. This was like, there was nothing here at the beginning of the day and we built this today. And that was super cool. And then we also bottled and labeled olive oil and wine. We had a tasting which was super fun with some American people that were there. And then I realized I am not a man manual labor person at all. Yes. And I decided to end that part of my journey a little earlier than normal, <laughs> which I was okay with. I just wanted to let it flow similar to everything else in life. And then I went back to Florence and those three days in Florence by myself were the best. I took cooking classes. I wandered around a city that I kind of already knew. I went to my favorite restaurants that I already been to and tried new ones. It was like I was a local living there. Yeah. And then I went to France and I took cooking classes there because I've always loved cooking in some way. It's easy to think about this in retrospect, but in mm. the moment I was like, I've always wanted to take cooking classes in France. But now I'm like, no, no, no. I was doing cooking competitions with my cousins growing up. I made my friends cook with me all the time. I loved having people over cooking for my parents, making breakfast for me and myself in the morning before school. And so I was in France for a week just taking cooking classes, the chef and myself, that's it, for 10 hours a day we were in the kitchen anything from deboning a chicken chicken and a fish to going to a sheep farm to see how they made their cheese and their milk and everything to cooking and plating like a smoked potato puree and putting that beautifully on a slate dish just learning everything which was the coolest because it gave me confidence in like how to make a sauce, how to season something well, the basics, which I kind of already understood, yeah. but I was in France learning it from a French chef. So I really understood it after this. Yes. So then I came back and we're two months into me not having a job, feeling the freest I have ever felt, feeling like it was pure vacation. I didn't need to work theoretically at this point in my life. I was like, this is great. I don't need to do anything besides this financial responsibility of being an adult that I do need to have a job. Right. 
So then I went back to traveling uh, and I traveled with some friends to Mexico City and that was just a fun trip exploring food, exploring culture. I came back and I was like, I need to find a job. So I was applying to jobs in the tech field that were similar to my strategy corporate job that I had before. And I was realizing none of these excited me. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the description of the job and I realized my day to day would be similar to what I had before. I would be answering emails in meetings, I would not be doing anything that was exciting to me. Maybe I was working at an exciting company that was about something that I would passion toward, like the environment or food, but it was not something that would keep me motivated long term. And so I was trying to figure out what things in life I loved doing. So I went to a yoga class and in this yoga class, we were sitting down before it even started. And I just had this epiphany come to me. I have no idea how. And it was like, you need to study nutrition. You need to do something with food and educate the world on food somehow. And so after that class, I researched different food programs. I called you. I talked to you about this since you are huge in this field as well. And you were like, this is the one I did. I loved it. I was looking into all of them. I did that one. Mm -hmm. And so I took this six week long plant based nutrition course, Mm -hmm. which was amazing. I changed the way that I eat. I was already pretty vegetarian before, but I was like now mostly plant based after taking the course, learning so much about the health benefits. But then I was like, what the heck do I do with this? I just I'm in the six week course. I don't have any jobs lined up. Now I need to start making money somehow. So I reached out to 60 different small food companies that I got on a list of a conference of organic and natural foods. And I reached out to them being like, hey, my name's Sabrina. I'm taking this like plant-based food course. I love your product because X, Y, and Z, or I love what you're doing because you stick to your values. And would you be open to having a conversation? Not even like, here's my resume, please hire me. Just like, I wanted to learn what it was like to be in the food industry from the small business owner's perspective because maybe I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. After a few of these calls, I realized I did not want to do that. It was so much stress, so Mm -hmm. many hoops to jump through of like getting on a grocery store shelf, but I knew I loved food and I wanted to do something with food. So I kept reaching out to different small companies and then finally a few of them were like, why don't you work part time for us? Why don't you do this project? Why don't you try this? And I had no idea this was a career path that was possible. No one tells you after college, you know, just reach out to companies and then they're going to offer you a job at some point in time (laughs) and it's going to be in a field that you want to work in right and you know what you want to do that was all insane to me and I think it was just putting in the hours of I want to try this so let me reach out to as many as I can that I firmly believe in their values for and then the ones that got back to me they were open to the opportunity of having someone join their team or they were the ones that were seeking something else out as well and they just have the personality of being very nice by (laughs) by responding to a random email right so And then I started working for food companies and I was like, this is awesome. I love this space, but I want to do something for myself Mm -hmm. and I want to do something else on the side that doesn't necessarily need to make me money, but it needs to fill my soul a little more than working for someone else. So then I was cooking one day for some of my friends that came over. Peter and I were hosting dinner parties at the time and they were like, you need to start an Instagram channel posting pictures about your food. And I was like, that is a really cool idea. And then I was like, you know what? I'm a film major. I really like film. Why don't I post videos about making recipes that I am creating or that I learned in France or in Italy and have them have a plant-based twist to it, Mm -hmm. which is kind of uncommon to have really good food that's plant-based. That's what people think. It's actually very common. But still having that ability to make it my own and be creative in developing the recipes as well as filming felt like an awesome creative outlet to me. Right. And so then through that, I realized, oh my gosh, there's so much I have to learn about this food space, about being an influencer, not really an influencer, just posting my recipes online. And I just loved it. I loved creating the food. I loved eating the food. I loved sharing this content and I loved inspiring people to eat more plant-based using the research and the nutrition facts that you and I both now know through Mm -hmm. taking that course and others. I'm going to pause there because I've been talking for like 10 minutes, but that was a lot. (laughs) No, that was incredible. You're such a good storyteller. And and I love that you 
are able to bring the emotion of each phase into mm. that story. Like I remember the day that you were laid off and I want to say we had a phone call planned that day or we yeah. were just texting that morning. And I remember, so let's say we were planning on having a phone call and I had texted you and said, Hey, you know, what time are you free? And I think you said something like, well, suddenly I'm free all day, anytime. And I think maybe you had a winky face in it. Mm -hmm. And I picked up the phone. I called you immediately. And I think I said, like, is this what I think it is? And you said, yes. And I said, congratulations. Yes, I remember (laughs) that. And I remember, I think Cal maybe even was like, why did you congratulate her? Yes. And (laughs) it's because at that point in your life, you had already been questioning, I mean, for months Mm -hmm. on our phone calls. It was very much of, okay, I'm not necessarily at the point where I can leave yet but I know this isn't it I'm just feeling a little lost on what it is Mm -hmm. and then the universe did the hard work for you I needed a jumping point and I needed a catalyzing event Mm -hmm. and that was totally it and so many people obviously lay being laid off is not a fun thing yeah. and I was just so fortunate to be able to take it in the mindset that it was a positive and being able to explore so many things during that time in between that I was able to come to my true passion around food and educating people on their own health but also just having it be kind of fun and creative still yes exactly and it's so funny I had even heard this spiritual teacher of one of my favorites, Gabby Bernstein was saying the other day that if ever one of her friends breaks up, gets laid off, has some sort of catalyzing, catastrophic, potentially traumatic event in their lives, she will always say congratulations. And many of them are like, why? And she said, if it didn't work out, clearly it wasn't meant to. And now the universe is guiding you towards something that is. I love that. And so I think constantly reframing things in terms of It's not that this happened to me. This happened for me. Now I get to figure out why. What's Absolutely. on the other side? Yeah. It, it brings me back to when I was babysitting. Yeah. Some parents have this philosophy, and I love it, where if a kid falls down, you say, yay, woohoo, because they're going off of your reaction to something, and then they're <laughs> feeding off of that energy, so they don't see it as this huge moment where they need to cry anymore. They're seeing it as like, oh, okay, this is okay that I fell down. It's okay to make this mistake, or it's okay that I'm feeling a little hurt. I have support right here. Right. And it kind of goes to that, where if you have friends that are telling you, no, this is a great thing in your life that just happened or like there will be a positive that comes out of it. You can start to shape your mind just like a two-year-old that fell over their own feet. Yes, I completely agree. So going back to that that point where you're laid off, you're feeling like, okay, this is a good thing. I finally mm-hmm. have this catalyzing event, as you said. And then you chose to travel. Yeah. And I want to ask about that decision because so many people when they're laid off, they instantly go into the job search. Or if there's some sort of traumatic breakup, they instantly maybe go right back into dating. There's, it's so rare to have that limbo time just to let yourself have that. Mm -hmm. So what was the thought process behind traveling and how did you even maybe combat remarks you might've gotten of like, oh, like you just lost your job and you're going to Italy and France. Just walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I've always been someone that likes taking time in between things. I think it makes it more of a clean break. Yeah. So after graduating college, I took two months to travel with one of my best friends. Mm. Uh, In between jobs, I took a month and I traveled and I went to a yoga retreat in Costa Rica. I love having that space to just be in between and it's journaling to leave all of the thoughts behind of that thing that you're leaving, the things that you're grateful for in that moment. Mm. And I knew I did not want to jump right into something else. A, I thought it would be the same issues that I was having if I just jumped in something else. B, it was also December. Like no one's hiring in December. So I kind of got away with the fact of like, well, it's the holiday break. No one's going to hire. I should just travel soon. Right. Uh, So that was easy enough. And then I think ultimately C is I love traveling. So what better to do when I have unlimited free time than do something that I love? And the two things that I did were one, take a cooking class and two, go on a farm and work. And those are not trips that you would necessarily take time off of work to then go work 
work on a farm or work in a well kitchen said. all day. So I thought, what better opportunity to do these two things that I have been wanting to do for years of my life now than right now. So it was just kind of a no brainer to me. Right. And there were no other places that interested me nearly as much. I was just drawn to this. Mm, so you were also following those intuitive breadcrumbs Absolutely. that were leading you to your destiny in a way. Way better spoken than what I thought in the moment. <laughs> these breadcrumbs became literal breadcrumbs <laughs> in Italy. <laughs> I love that. Exactly. So in those moments where you were not ecstatic on some sort of trip where you're in Italy you're in mm. France you're in Mexico City those moments where you were back in LA yeah and sometimes I do remember on phone calls very occasionally but sometimes oh, yeah it's like the the heaviness of your reality would hit and you would say yeah. Dev I really don't know what I'm gonna do and you'd yeah. say I'm still I'm staying Sabrina I'm staying upbeat and optimistic but I'm a little lost in those moments how did you kind of pick yourself back up again and how did you find clarity in those months off work to eventually find what you're doing now? Yeah, I, there are two good questions and nuggets in there. And I'm remembering the second one more than the first. Can you repeat the first yeah. one? So, I so the first was just, how did you pick yourself up okay. whenever you started to kind of get down on your luck again? Okay, uh, for that one, it was just constant affirmation that this is all meant to be mm. and going back to that I know it's kind of a spiritual message for some but for yeah. me it really sticks of like I'm meant to be struggling right now I'm meant to not know what it is and the time will come yeah. and I think another beautiful thing is I had never really known what my passion was so yeah. it wasn't that abnormal of a feeling I knew that the backup option was I can work at a grocery store and make money if I need to or this tea yeah. place right here I can do these things if I absolutely need to and I will learn from that experience and it will be a cool unique experience so mm -hmm. worst case scenario that is my worst case scenario yes and that helped me reframe okay I will be fine and my best case scenario is finding out what I want to do and be passionate about it and doing it and that's what happened mm -hmm. and it was just beautiful that it unfolded in that way right so that's the first part and then can you remind me of the second question yeah it's my memory problem the second no you have no memory <laughs> problem do not affirm that the second is how did you actually find clarity what exercises did you mm. use to reflect and kind of get you closer to oh I found it yeah so when I was working at my job before uh, DoorDash where I was laid off I actually did a 40 page workshop of what are the values that I have as a person and how does that relate to my work and how does that show up in my work? Is it, do I want a community at work? Is it, do I want to really balance life so I don't really want to work as much as other people? Do I want to climb the corporate ladder and achieve success in that traditional way? Yes. And I looked back at that. I realized some things had changed, but I redid that exercise and I did it from the standpoint of where I am now after having that new experience, which checked so many of the boxes that I was looking for but mm -hmm. now every experience you have changes the way that you view your next experience because you right. learn from it obviously so from that I realized okay I, I can work from home and have a great community online still or if I at least have one meeting with someone during the week I have that presence I don't need to be in a huge team environment so that made me realize I can work for a small company it doesn't need to be a large company yeah basic changes like that helped me reframe what I was looking for in ways that I hadn't before and then I think yeah. also having spent so much time around where food comes from what to do to prepare food and how we all love food as a world yeah helped me realize I wanted to do something with food I just didn't know what it was okay and then the third part is I love learning so when I was like I want to do something with food I'm like how can I become more of an expert in this or learn more about it besides taking a cooking class how can I learn about the science behind a micro and a macronutrient and how they get digested and work together in your body to make yeah. you a functioning energetic human being and that really sparked this I like learning and I like learning about this it's kind of like the reason why people go to graduate school they right. want to learn more about that subject so that was just an affirmation to me if I'm on the right path mm -hmm. because I not only like learning I like learning about this mm, well said and I especially like that first piece about reflecting on your values mm -hmm. because I think especially so many of us who have been you know privileged to grow up in 
families that encourage our education and support us reaching our goals and going as far as we can that we end up kind of staying on this straight and narrow path yeah. that's been encouraged out of a desire for safety and success for their children and and whatever and so after years of potentially being in a corporate job that was fine but also not it so many of us have that epiphany moment of okay this isn't it and I don't even know what I value mm -hmm. like do I have the same values that you know encouraged my parents to maybe shove me in this direction right. or encouraged society to tell me that this path is better than this path you know the messaging is all around us it's not just parents yeah and getting that time to reflect and say what actually matters to me because you even mentioned you know balance and maybe I don't want to work super hard and not feeling shame in saying that mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing yeah I think it was also helpful that for the past few months I had had no work I had had no responsibilities and feeling the lack of stress for I need to wake up and be prepared for this meeting or let me prep after work to make sure that everything is going smoothly I loved having the de-stressed life yeah. that I was able to have when I wasn't working so I was like how do I maintain that how do I maintain going to pickleball for five hours a week still while still working because yeah. those things now are so important now that I've lived enough time three months to be able to figure out what my day-to-day -day life looked like how do I have enough time to make homemade food that tastes right. really good still right and that to me was crucial in finding my next role absolutely that's that's amazing well I feel like you have landed in some might say the perfect scenario I know um I say landed but you built it for yourself I mean that took eh, yes and no. I mean I <laughs> I appreciate when everyone says that but for me I'm like I don't know it just it fell onto my lap I was yeah. super lucky and I do feel like this happens to people that just put the manifestation forward that yes. care about it that have a vision of what they want and for yeah. me it was the kind of life that I wanted the kind of job the kind of things I wanted to be working on creatively yeah and with that this just kind of happened I could not have drawn this up but I could not have drawn up something better absolutely and I also think when something is meant for us it's almost as if it happens easily mm -hmm. and it doesn't dismiss yeah. the hard work that has gone into it your yeah. hours of learning about the Instagram algorithm and filming and editing all of that is very real yeah but when you love it and it's meant for you it's like the doors kind of just open I know it is crazy that all of these small businesses these CEOs were getting back to me and spending an hour of their time talking to me and yeah. now the CEO of this company that I'm working for I get to spend each week asking him questions about the industry and him telling me new projects to work on but more insight and I feel so lucky to not only get to like be a part of this company but then to also have this mentorship yeah. and I'm like how how did this happen but it maybe is what you're saying where it's like no you're on the right path and this is super important yeah. for you to be able to continue on this journey absolutely I've often heard that the universe has your back or the universe is conspiring for you mm -hmm. and if we can really look at the world through that lens of how is the world trying to help me get closer to what's meant for me right now yeah even going back to the whole laying off how is this not happening to me but happening for me mm -hmm. and just following those intuitive breadcrumbs and seeing where it leads and saying yes when something feels like a full body yes mm -hmm. and saying no when it doesn't yeah that is truly I feel like that's the compass we were all born with for a reason it's like when yeah. we were planted on this planet God the universe sky daddy whatever you want to call it <laughs> said oh I know how you're gonna not get lost in life you're gonna have this compass mm -hmm. called your intuition yeah. now learn to use it and when you forget I hope you have a friend that reminds you yeah. how to use it <laughs> and I think it's great because one of my goals outside of work for the past few years has been to follow my intuition more and to be more aligned with it as well as yeah. my gut and saying yes to things that I truly believe in it's that 100% if it's not 100% hell yes. yes then it's a hell no yes that's what you and your mom say so exactly. 
I think that has been helpful too to bring me to the point where the layoff happened then and I was already curating that ability to yeah. trust my gut and my instinct more and then listening to that when it actually happened and moving forward with it and being able to have that free time to explore and play still like yeah. all of those components together kind of made this magical situation happen but it Absolutely. is being really in tune with what feels right what feels good Absolutely so speaking about intuition being in tune I want to talk a little bit about your spiritual journey yeah because it starts with you <laughs> so you want to talk starts about that? with me it ends with me here we are I well I don't think I've ever really talked to you about how you have perceived this whole journey because mm. I have obviously I have felt like I've walked this path like holding your hand yeah just being excited to teach you to ask you questions yeah. but I want to hear from your perspective Let's start with even your childhood. What was kind of your spiritual upbringing background? What were the beliefs you grew up believing? Yeah. yeah. So my parents, my mom is from Spain and so they're religious in Spain. She's not the most religious. Okay. Um, and then my dad is not religious at all, but my grandparents are very religious on my dad's side. Mm -hmm. So we always went growing up went to Sunday school and they went to church and I went to Sunday school and I liked it because there were donut holes but I did not like the lessons that were learned or anything I just didn't feel the connection there right as maybe some kids that then end up growing up to be religious uh end up feeling as well they're there for the right. donut holes and then the lessons come later <laughs> yes. I was there for the food and now I'm in food so this is perfect Absolutely. <laughs> so growing up we had that and then maybe when I was 10 or so we stopped going and then there was just no religion really okay uh until until I think that we had both graduated from college yeah. or maybe you were a senior in college and I was back living at home and one summer uh, yeah. we were in your room late at night and yes. we were talking about books that we had read and you mentioned Many Lives, Many Masters yeah. and that opened the door. I was like, wait, what is this? I've never heard of the idea of past lives. I've never heard of the idea of you living different lives, having different lessons that you learn in each life. But as soon as you said it, I felt so connected to it. Maybe that's when my intuition really was starting to shine. Who knows? But it was just this moment of, I believe this. And I've never felt that way for any other religious practice or teaching that I've heard, that my friends have told me about, that they do, that I so respect, but just didn't feel drawn to it. This yeah. I felt a connection to. So that was the start of it. And then reading that book as well as A New Earth and just many of the other books that we read in our book club, being yeah. around the people that you introduced me to through our spirit spiritual book club yeah. also helped me validate this feeling is real I don't know if I can 100% believe it right away because it's better to be a skeptic about some things and then fully dive in once you've had those moments of questioning. Right. And so having those moments of questioning, I think, helped me to get to now this strong belief of the universe does have our back. Yeah. Everything is meant to happen for a reason. And there have been continuous examples, whether it's as simple as a tarot card reading that really resonates or a huge life event like being laid off that spurred this whole new part of my passion in my life and I feel like so much more free than I ever would have if that didn't happen yeah oh I love hearing that and I remember that night yeah so well that was one of the best nights of my life I agree it's like that in my wedding <laughs> oh I was at both you were <laughs> and you were too <laughs> yes in fact fun fact Sabrina actually officiated our wedding so fun so much more to say on that but that night I remember I think, you know, the lights were off in my room. Maybe we had my Himalayan salt lamp yes. and some fairy lights. It was very just moody. Yeah, <laughs> moody. That's right. And having those conversations where I remember even as I was sharing these lessons that I learned from these books, that I too had chills the whole time. That yes. sense of why does something about this feel so right it's almost like we're remembering something we knew to be true and we'd forgotten mm -hmm. totally and it's you know what was hard for me was that no one else really in my life believed that mm. and it's such an easy thing to dismiss or to yeah. be a skeptic about yeah anything that's woo woo typically is looked down upon or you're seen as someone that just isn't really set in realism <laughs> yeah and I think that it was kind of easy for me I've never really needed to be with the grain oh. and so it was easy for me to 
just let go of what other people were saying but it was yeah. harder because there was no one else besides you and then the people that then you introduced me to through yeah. the book club to talk about these things with and it's so much to explore for any religion any spirituality just yeah. what are your thoughts around these things yes. and the more that me personally I talk about it the more helpful and clarity I have toward yeah. my feelings absolutely and I feel like having some form of spiritual belief no matter what it is whether it's judaism catholicism whatever the heck we believe yeah, i don't know i don't, know what, what, I don't know what you call it <laughs> <laughs> um that's funny i hadn't thought of that but i think believing in something makes life a so much more na- magical but also so much more i don't know if i want to say comfortable that's not the word i'm looking for reassuring Um, yes reassuring I get it it's like if you're going through a hard time yes you can turn to something yeah it doesn't necessarily it does tie to purpose a lot of the time but it doesn't have to it's just that sense of there's something else out there that's bigger than me and that's okay if I'm not doing all right today exactly because there will be a day that I will and just continuing that thought of it will be okay the universe has my back or God is out there whatever it may be yes I think that was really comforting that I never felt before either and then just having it be so genuinely sticking to me and it's not like I wanted to be your friend or we were like trying to find some common ground it was like no no no. what you're saying I get and I like and I want to learn more and I ask a hundred (laughs) questions about (laughs) hey you and me both (laughs) so from that night how did the practice of tarot cards come into your life Mm -hmm. and kind of more of the actual practices, the journaling, manifestation, how did that work its way in? You know, that was around the same time that I started yoga. Mm. And I think that they're beautifully combined in many ways where it's just being more in tune with yourself and your body. And I had picked up journaling a few months before. It's been on and on on and off in my life, but now it's very on since that moment. So I, I think that journaling about the feelings and thoughts or when I was reading a book being like, this is really interesting to me or highlighting different sections. I think it also really helps that you had the community based book club for us so you had I think five or six of us gals yeah we would host us over we would go to other people's houses we had plant-based snacks and then we had these books that we were reading that were all spiritual and for me it was my first time reading them for some people it was multiple times that Mm -hmm. they were reading it but we all came in with different perspectives but an open mind and open to what other people were saying and I think that really helped one form this community-based area which is huge in any sort of spirituality yeah and then two the the ability that you can express your own ideas and beliefs about something that made me feel more confident in it because I was Mm -hmm. able to ask my skeptical questions about it and be like well what do you think about this or how does this weigh into this concept I can't think of any of those right now otherwise I would give these examples but just in general having that group I think really helped and then you and I did tarot cards you bought me my first deck of tarot (laughs) cards and from then it was like oh I'm having a tough day let me pull a tarot card. Let me go to this as something that is different from what I would normally do. Mm-hmm. And you can take them as seriously or as not seriously as you want. And for me, it was just a fun activity to do that always felt like it hit the nail on the head. And Absolutely. I was like, how does it know? And it's just the energy around the cards, yourself, what you're feeling, yeah. and being able to fully put faith and trust in it right. because I was skeptical. Yeah. I I love hearing the journey and the fact that the book club was so helpful it having was. that community. It's also interesting because you and I were just talking about this for hours yesterday about how I was sharing that I often feel very alone in my spirituality. That other than you, a few key players in my life, I'm constantly seeking the spiritual community, yeah. which I hadn't really put two and two together until this very moment. But in the same way that I decided... I am starting a women's spiritual book club. I'm going to do tarot cards each time. We're going to drink cacao. That's why I started this podcast. Absolutely. It's like I'm really seeking that community where I don't have to be alone in it. And I say alone, like there are a few of us, but in the grand scheme of things, it can be a lonely path. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you say that because we were just talking about your bachelorette party too and how it was in Portland. But for those of you that don't know, you had a cacao ceremony at your (laughs) bachelorette party and tarot card reading. And for many people there, they were not 
interested in Mm -hmm. that before but they were there to support you they were there to have that community so despite you knowing that these people are not fully invested you still want to create that sense of community and do something that you feel so connected to so it makes so much sense that this podcast is another way to express that and just put it out and see what happens and see what comes because you're on the right path right these doors are going to be opening absolutely and I also feel like for anyone that's out there that somehow finds the podcast and maybe they feel alone in their spiritual beliefs and then suddenly it's like oh this girl Devin also loves tarot cards and manifestation it just even if I never meet you in real life it feels like a genuine connection like we were meant to be connected in this way and the people that are spiritual will get that yes Exactly. I agree. So something else I want to touch on relating to your spiritual journey is that the fact that you and your amazing fiance have different spiritual beliefs. Yeah. And I think that's really important to talk about because, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, Cal is very much aligned with my spiritual beliefs. It was just a shot in the dark. It worked (laughs) out, whatever. But you and Peter, who have an amazing relationship, like role model relationship in so many ways, also have been able to create this respect and safety around the fact that you believe different things and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of just speak to that a little bit for anyone out there that's listening that maybe they are alone in their spiritual beliefs or their partner is on a totally different path? Mm -hmm. How have you navigated that and what's that like? Yeah. So for background context, my fiance, Peter is Catholic. Mm -hmm. I am whatever our spiritual belief (laughs) is. We're going to call it magical manifestation. I I don't know. I love that. And I think at the beginning, so we started dating a few years before I had gone on this journey. So when we started dating, he was the religious one. I wasn't spiritual at all. We didn't talk too much about it. And then I started having all of these conversations with you and just learning more about my beliefs and having beliefs myself and I talked to him about them a lot and I think that the initial conversations were really hard because for him being Catholic they're not the same beliefs that he so strongly believes in and it's hard for someone that he already had a three or four year long relationship at that point in time to have differing beliefs that they felt so strongly in as well Mm -hmm. and so at first it was just hey, this is what I'm feeling. These are the reasons I'm skeptical about it. I want to hear more about you and your spiritual journey and how you Mm -hmm. got there. And it kind of opened the door for us to talk about his spirituality more and his religion in a beautiful way that I didn't realize beforehand. So one, it deepened the relationship because we were both able to talk about this new level and layer because Mm -hmm. we had differing thoughts, but both very deep thoughts. And I think the hardest part was he had, 24 25 years at that point in time of believing in that and I had a year two years so it was hard for him to see my perspective but as time has gone on and I've continued to grow even stronger in this it's been easier to have conversations or be like I'm using the word manifestation and that's fine if you don't use it but you know where I'm coming from now yes and you know how that feels so at the beginning it was tough it wasn't like easy immediately and it was uncomfortable because it's so important to both of us this is like your purpose or the thing that you believe in so treating it delicately and with respect which is what you should do with any partnership that you're in or any relationship you have I think that is the foundation that we took for this difficult topic where we're in different ends but for me I'm so open-minded he's so open-minded and us both being able to agree that we aren't changing what we believe in but we are accepting and respecting what the other believes in is the greatest common ground that you can come to Mm -hmm. in that I think and and then just continuing to talk about, oh, I read this article, I read this book. Or when we go to visit his family and we're in mass, I ask questions like, what does that mean? Or why do you do this? So continuing to be curious about the other person also helps it feel less like a divided household and more like we're both in this together. We just have different views, but our common values are also the same. It's not like either of us believe in something crazy like we both are kind people Mm -hmm. and we both believe in very uh religious catholic practices of being nice to other people yeah and i think that at the core if we were different there it would be a lot harder right so you have to have the same values you have to be open-minded and you need to hear what the other person's saying and respect what they're saying 
Right. And be curious and ask them questions about it. Absolutely. And it also sounds like by having those conversations in some ironic way it's almost like you realize you have more common ground Mm -hmm. more in common than you don't yeah that you both believe there's something more out there than just us human beings yeah we're probably here for a reason Mm -hmm. we are being guided and supported in some way yeah it's important to be kind whatever you put out in the world will come back to you in some way yeah some saw it say it's karma some say it's something else but it's always these similar beliefs we just give them different names and then divide each other up into these groups and pretend like we can't talk to one another yeah and it's just not true for example i don't know if you know this but the woman that gave me many lives many masters that forever changed my life i didn't even realize that there was a person that gave you that exactly that's a crazy that i'm whole new world Mm explored okay and that person is a hasidic orthodox jew yep so my friend Sara from yes. Ohio State Chabad had given me this uh, this book because she knew that I was deeply spiritual. I liked tarot cards. I was always yeah. a little, you know, witchy off the beaten path. <laughs> and she had said, hey, I read this book written by a psychiatrist. And in Judaism, we believe about past lives. We believe that the soul goes on. Yeah. That there's something more that this consciousness has been and will be again. And I think you're really going to like this book. And... I mean, obviously it forever changed my life yeah. and then impacted <laughs> others' lives. So many others. <laughs> and so it's just really beautiful to think that we really do have so much in common and yeah. we just give it different names. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a really nice point to bring yeah. up where like, no matter what you call it, we don't even know what to call it. You don't mm-hmm. need to call it or label it anything. Yeah. You just believe in the same core common values. And even if you don't believe in an afterlife or past lives, there are other things that are related Absolutely. about how you live this life. Absolutely. Well said. So speaking a little bit about even your relationship with Peter, I want to touch on the fact that you guys both took a class at Northwestern. I believe you both took it called Marriage 101. He did not take it. I did. Peter. I know. Okay, Peter. We have something to talk about. I know. He took a leadership class instead. Oh, boring. Peter, really? Anyway, (laughs) we'll get there Dinner tonight's going to be great. (laughs) Great. So I want to know what you remember from Marriage 101. Mm -hmm. And even if you remember nothing from Marriage 101, I want us to kind of then segue that into just your relationship with Peter and the things that you think you guys do really well. Mm Because I can name a million of them. But (laughs) let's start with Marriage 101 if you remember anything and segue into Peter. (laughs) Yeah. What I loved about Marriage 101, so the teacher also wrote the book that we were reading and the book okay. each chapter was talking about something different and then had an exercise to do so mm-hmm. it was like homework but the homework was I mean it was intense but it was like think about people and relationships in your childhood that influence the way that you see love mm-hmm. so a lot of the core foundation of your love now and how you receive love now is actually from your childhood and what you saw and your past or past relationships. And then it's how you cycle out of those bad habits or how you repeat the good habits that you Mm. see. And if you have bad examples, you may only fall into those bad examples and then repeat those. Or you may see that and want to change that completely. So you are not open to relationships like those that you saw at all. So that's one thing, a lot on the history and the past. And it comes to like the psychology of attachment styles as a kid growing up and how your parents interacted with you and the attachment style you had there and how that plays a role in your relationship too. And you have different relationship attachment styles. So I think a lot from your childhood impacts your love now, but it can be easily changed and intertwined with you working and journaling and thinking about it and thinking about how it came to be. A huge thing that I remember from Marriage 101, there were two big essays that we wrote. One was about a relationship that we went into the city and interviewed a couple that had been married for many years. And we asked them questions about their, like how it started, their honeymoon phase, the engagement, the uh, planning a wedding, the wedding, and then this post-marriage what is, what are your financials like? How do you decide on these difficult issues? How are you different in your religion? And how does that play a role in everyday life? Are you more of an introvert or an extrovert? How does that play into you two as a couple? We then observed their body language as they were talking and everything. And we wrote a paper on that. 
And then we did the same for our parents and their love story. Oh. And so I called up my parents and interviewed them about it. And I had just formed such a stronger bond to both of them through that experience. They're divorced, but I got to hear both sides and them talking about it in a positive and then sometimes negative light yeah. just showed the true sides of marriage that you don't see unless you're in it. Right. So I think that uh, is a great reminder in my relationship now where it's like, People on the outside can see great things in it, but we know what makes it special Mm -hmm. and we get to be around that every day. And that's like the beauty of the relationship. It's just yours. Right. Oh, I love those essays too. I know. That's really magical. Yeah, it was magical. (laughs) Wow. I also love what you taught me last night about the restaurant. Can you share that? Oh, okay. There's this (laughs) fun little tidbit of uh, typically women uh, get a little jealous. And so if there are two seats at a restaurant across from each other and one is facing a wall and the other is facing the room and the crowd, the woman will likely sit facing the crowd so that the Uh, If they're in a heterosexual relationship, Mm -hmm. uh, the man will sit across from them and only look at them and the wall. (laughs) And the women will be able to see all of the other options out there, whereas the men would be too tempted to. Yes. I don't believe in this. (laughs) (laughs) But it was just a funny little tidbit as I took the seat facing the wall and you got to stare at the empty other seats around us. (laughs) Yes. All the empty seats and the one waiter. And the one waiter. Yeah. Absolutely. So going back to your relationship with Peter, I mentioned there are so many things you guys do well many of which I could name but I wanted to ask you if you two were teaching a relationship class Mm -hmm. and you were sharing only one aspect of your relationship teaching others how to improve theirs what do you think you two do best I don't think we take life too seriously. Right. And that can be different for other people, but that is like the core value that we have. Yeah. And it gets back to core values, but the core value of not taking life too seriously and being extremely kind individuals to each other. Yeah. And that includes patience when talking about things. Uh, That includes two strangers when opening the door for them. We just live in a similar way, which is nice. And you don't need to be the same as your partner. Yeah. But you do need to have have those same core values and I think for us it is being laid back about things where if either one of us neither of us got our way we'd be okay spending time with each other doing the other person's activity and we'd spend time together being kind and nice to each other and having so much fun doing that kind and nice are not like vanilla qualities in our book they're like the golden star (laughs) that we look for in people and that is like the epitome of a person to us that we want to hang out with right Uh, they also have to be fun like we don't want to yeah but I think those are the things, like that's the main thing that we are on the same page about it and we live our lives like that. So if a conflict comes up, we realize it's okay. We don't need to take this too seriously. Let's think about all the angles. Let's figure out both of our thoughts on it and let's talk about it from a very kind person perspective where we see the other side and we are open about it. Yes. And the fact that you mentioned you two are not the same. I think you have this shared playful spirit. Yes spunky youthfulness Mm -hmm. like sometimes I look at him and I feel like he's still just a little boy that loves fantasy and video games and he totally is right and you guys both love board games and all of that it's it's just this fun spirited playfulness that is often lost in the adult world yeah and that's one of the it's like the bit of glue that really holds you two together amongst many other things. Yeah. But going back to the fact that you two aren't the same, we've already touched on the fact that you have these different spiritual beliefs and you've been able to find this respect and safety around that. And I also want to touch on the fact that you two eat, a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I was thinking eating differently and then also he's an introvert and I'm an extrovert oh, and dealing with that. Totally an extrovert. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'll touch on the eating first, um, yes. which will segue into so many things. I'm sure. Yes. But he, so I turned like 90% plant-based at this point in time. Yeah. And we've been living together for a year and a half now and I was not plant-based when we moved in, but I didn't cook meat when we moved in. Uh, but he would add his own meat protein to a dish and I would add my own like beans or whatever to a dish and over the course of the last like nine months 
cancer. So he does not eat any red meat, which is helpful for the environment. But then also me taking these health classes and spewing out little facts. He's yeah. like, you know what? Maybe maybe I should eat more like this. He still yeah. has his cold cut turkey sandwich for lunch every day. Of course. However, for dinners and breakfast, the things that I make because I love cooking and I love the love language of giving people food and having them enjoy it, I will cook for both of us for breakfasts and dinners. And those meals, he now is totally fine having be 100% plant-based. It's oh. been a transition in like the last six months or so where Great. obviously if we're out traveling, he'll get whatever he wants and order it out. And yeah. last night he was alone for dinner, so he made salmon. But right. like if I'm cooking, he's totally fine having a plant-based meal. I was like, hey, can you get these like plant-based sausages from the store? And he's like, yeah, this flavor looks great to me or this one. And he was excited about it. So the transition from six years ago when we both ate the same yeah. to then both of us giving up red meat to then me becoming more vegetarian, him staying the same yeah. to then me becoming more plant-based us living together and having semi different proteins mm -hmm. for each meal to then him being like, wait, the food you make is really good. <laughs> because Not it gonna is. Lie. <laughs> uh, so let me then just eat it. And yeah. I know the benefits that I'm getting from eating it. So why should I fight this? Absolutely. So that's and, a huge thing. And in your own journey, I had known that you had been kind of vegetarian mm -hmm. for a while. I don't think I know or knew why. Was it the environment? And so it, when did that happen? So in college, I became a pescatarian. Okay. Uh, because it was not a rebellious thing for me, but I was just like, I make my own choices now. One of my best friends uh, was vegan or vegetarian for like basically 10 years prior. And wow. so I was like, okay, I see this around me. It seems great. It was semi-environment, but that's just like what people say that care about the environment. Like yeah. I didn't really know why. I knew, you know, the water that it takes for a cow is yeah. so much in the land that they consume. Yeah. So I knew the basics, but I didn't really understand why. And I did not realize the health benefits at all when I did it. Yeah. And then I lived in my sorority house where it was kind of impossible to be a pescatarian. So then I went back to eating some meat. And then I realized, you know what? I can have fun with vegetarian dishes. A lot of my friends are vegetarian. A lot of my friends are vegan. These are the people I kind of want to be like and be around more. Why is that? There's definitely yes. no correlation necessarily between right. being a vegan and being a cool person. Though right. Maybe there is. Maybe there is. Uh, <laughs> I, but I just feel like so many of the people around me and in my life yeah. were vegan or vegetarian that I aspired to be like. Mm -hmm. And so that was the instigating moment for me where I was like, why not be more like them? And when cooking, I I didn't love to cook meat. There was no enjoyment aspect of it. It kind yeah. of felt like, okay, you're cooking chicken, you're seasoning it with something, and then it tastes like that. Whereas yeah. with vegetarian, you could try different things. The sauce mattered more. There was more flavor that you could add to things. You got a control of the spices. It felt more like a creative art form, yeah. which I guess is another reason that I was drawn to it. I like that you can use almost the challenge of being plant-based mm. or vegetarian in order to get more creative. Yes. Like I found that even when I go to restaurants, if we sometimes will call ahead, if it's a restaurant where it's a little trickier to be vegan, vegetarian, and we'll say, hey, we got four plant-based eaters coming. Is the chef able to prepare anything? So often the chef is like, interesting. That's fun. What can I do with vegetables? Yes. So I like using the the challenge to just be more creative I think it totally is and not that you can't be creative with other food that has been shown time and time again yes. but I think it's newer to be creative with vegetables or vegan dishes yeah. because it hasn't been done as much so you can be equally as creative because yeah. there are as many flavors as there are with meat dishes in my opinion because Absolutely. it's all about the spices and the sauces and everything all you do about. to the meat I agree so speaking of plant-based eating mm-hmm I know that we are both very passionate about all of the reasons to be plant-based, the health, the environment, the animals, just all the things, yeah. you know, general, generally better for humanity as a whole. Um, and we took the same plant-based nutrition course mm -hmm. through Cornell. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when you were even taking the course, were there certain themes, lessons that you had learned that were the most compelling for you that made you decide to transition to being more plant-based? So before I, yeah. it was like a lot of the environmental reasons 
And through that class, it then totally switched to be more of the health reasons. Wow. I think I'm a very data-backed science person. Like I track my sleep every night, making sure that I get the right amount, that my REM cycles are the same. Yeah. And for me, seeing the data, I think it was just a lot of cardiovascular data that stood out to me first. Like that's what I can remember. But many other studies that they had in all of the classes yeah. were just constantly drilling home the point that plant-based eating is better. You don't have your arteries clogged as much yeah. you are living longer you know all of the blue zone areas I loved that aspect and I know that you love that right. too I think those were the areas where I was like wait a second there's science behind this yeah so we should be doing it and it tastes great still and if you combine different things you make a very holistic diet with just plants which yeah you don't learn growing up you learn to you learn that got milk is a campaign and you learn to eat protein and you learn that bread is bad if you want to go on a diet but actually all of those things are kind of false yes and so it was taking all the beliefs and the marketing that we grew up with and flipping it on its head and that's when I was like oh I like this yeah. because you're showing me the science behind why yours is right or this right. way of eating is a healthier way of eating absolutely and I know something we were even talking about this morning while we were preparing our breakfast is that you know food is not just fuel but as I was sharing that Cal and I love that food is medicine mm -hmm. and that quote that I kept saying of let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food yeah that every meal we make we almost set the intention of may this heal our bodies I love that yeah and it it just makes the food probably energetically more medicinal as well mm -hmm. and when you're staring at a bowl that has kale and sweet potatoes and chickpeas and you know that every antioxidant polyphenol phytonutrient there is going to heal you in some way it's going to help your microbiome it's going to help your brain it's all of that it just I mean, it gets me excited yeah. from more than just eating this delicious thing. Absolutely. And what you just said there with your gut and the microbiome, yeah. I think that was a huge thing too, because mm. you have so many organisms in your microbiome and your gut. You have like as many as the rest of your body yeah. or more. I can't even remember. And I was like, wait a second, we can control that. We can control what we're feeding it if we're feeding it too much sugar and then the bad uh, cells are growing more. Yes whatever it is like we can control what that is and by feeding it nutrients and this nourishing food we can yeah. actually help it and this is like the biggest part of our body that helps everything run obviously there's so many parts of our body that are important Absolutely. but our gut helps monitor so much yes immune system sleep mood everything mm -hmm. and I, I mean there are so many studies that I find compelling I think two that I want to quickly mention while we're here because you and I were just mm -hmm. talking about them mm -hmm. but there's always the the skeptical pushback of well what about the way we used to eat as hunter gatherers and didn't we evolve to be these hefty masculine meat eating hunter men <laughs> and as we were sharing that actually when we look at fecal matter from those days we find that we were still eating predominantly plant-based because we didn't always get the kill that we wanted and yet it was based on what the women and the children were gathering that was actually feeding the community. But on top of that, in terms of the argument against, you know, didn't we evolve to be this certain way? Those two studies that we were reading, the one, the 1990 study that came out, I think in the, the American Journal of Cardiology or something like that, that talked about that they found if you feed any cholesterol to a carnivore let's say a dog you can feed them endless amounts of cholesterol saturated fat you name it and their arteries will not clog but if you feed any cholesterol to an herbivorous or mainly herbivorous animal like a rabbit that they did in the study you will instantly clog their arteries and promote heart disease and so that was a groundbreaking like revolutionary study for the world of cardiology because they found that perhaps humans are more herbivorous than they are omnivorous. And then there was also that 2003 meta-analysis of over 55 different studies that showed all of the physiological similarities that humans have with these herbivorous animals. Yeah. Um, like the one we were talking about is that carnivores produce their own vitamin C because they don't consume any vitamin C in their diet humans and 
herbivores cannot produce their own vitamin C because they have to consume it in their foods. And where do we get our vitamin C? Only from plant foods. Mm -hmm. So studies like that almost give me chills. Absolutely. Because I, I think it addresses the common question that I get. The most common one for why are you plant based? We weren't plant based as a society when we were hunters gatherers. It answers those questions. Yes. And I think that that is just such a great again, science to prove that we weren't necessarily the carnivorous creatures we think that we were because we had the title hunters and gatherers. Yeah, absolutely. And then there was that quote that I showed you, I think from Dr. (laughs) Kim Williams, who used to be the president of the American College of Cardiology. And he said there are two types of cardiologists, vegans and those who haven't read the research. Exactly. (laughs) And those kinds of quotes are just so eye-opening and even as we're sitting here now we're sharing all this information in a completely non-judgmental way absolutely like we are both I mean we were just talking about how much we adore your fiance Peter who eats in a different way and that's totally fine totally but I think just being aware of the research and being able to evaluate for yourself yeah what you want you know am I am I willing to potentially give up a year or two of my life in order to enjoy this food or what matters to you and just being aware of the pros and cons on both directions is really important yeah I think the biggest thing I was trying to get clear on why I'm in the food space and I think Mm -hmm. the biggest thing is to give people the choice I don't want to force people to be plant-based or vegan I want them to just know the research know what I learned last year and that changed my world and if it doesn't change their world that's okay but I feel like as a society we don't have a nutrition course that's required of all high schoolers graduating and I think that would be really beneficial so that everyone could just get this foundation because right now it's based on marketing or fad diets or these influencers that may not have the actual science backing them up but are popular so they're being heard yes and so with all of those I want to make sure that we are spreading correct information that we are spreading like the science behind things that then people are fueled to be able to make the decisions that they want and I think there's a third component which may get controversial or political but it's like we need to stop lobby groups from lobbying and spending money on the potato chip industry or the sugar industry or the meat and dairy industry absolutely and there was this one lobby I love pizza but there was this one (laughs) lobby group called like the pizza lovers lobby group and it was to lobby for having more pizza and they like all they're trying to do is like get more pizza out there in the world and who doesn't love pizza it's phenomenal however everything in moderation you know and like you don't need to have pizza every day but these lobbyists like they want that and a huge thing that broke my heart during the class was reading about all these lobby groups and I would like cry to Peter every night and I would be like how is our world and our government set up where people can get paid ten thousand dollars to vote no on having there be a subsidy for vegetables Mm -hmm. and the vegetable industry and how that can actually be cost efficient for people to buy instead of the sodas that they're buying. Like what if your plants were priced as sodas? Imagine a world where that existed. So that's the third and final thing that I want to do is one, educate people to have them be able to make the choice and then three, give them an actual representative affordable solution absolutely in their stores i really love that answer because even what you said about educating people that i recently had a podcast with dr shannon smith one of the first interviews and she had been a pediatrician and she shared with me she said do you know how much nutrition education i was given in med school And I said, I don't know, maybe a class. And she said, one hour. Yep. And so I bring that up to say, we can no longer rely on even the people we deem as experts to give us this information. We need to educate ourselves. We need to look at the studies. We need to find reputable resources and really make those choices for ourselves and not just rely on what one person is saying or whatever like find the actual data the research the studies Mm -hmm. and also what you're saying about lobby groups I could not agree with more and I remember even in my health coaching certification one of the most emotional lectures I say emotional because I had the same emotional reaction you did where I was just upset almost to tears there was this man who had been a cattle rancher his whole life that had 
gotten really deep into learning about the lobby groups and eventually he learned about plant-based nutrition. He had this really fascinating journey. I wish I could remember his name, but he shared just some of what actually goes on behind the scenes. And he essentially said, this is not some sort of conspiracy theory. I mean, this is real. There are people in power that are trying to keep the healing information, the information that will help us heal our planet and ourselves out of our hands. And so that's why it's all about really educating yourself or, I mean, you can't rely on anyone else. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. So this is a PSA for all schools. (laughs) Get a nutrition course. It does not need to be plant-based eating. It just needs to be, here's what a micronutrient does to you. Here's a carbohydrate. Don't fear them. Uh, Just more general knowledge. And it does not need to be a psych study that is like plant-based eating is the only way to live. It's just presentation of knowledge so that people can then make an informed decision. Absolutely. And speaking about not fearing carbohydrates, I just wanted to slip that in there because that is one of the biggest um, questions I get. I think when people see what I eat and they see that I'm eating bananas and beans and potatoes and people are always like, oh, but carbs, Mm -hmm. like I can have some potato, but not too much. Crazy. And I know. And I bring that up because I also used to feel the same way. I don't know if you know this, but in high school, I was essentially on like a strict paleo diet. Yeah. Yep. Tons of meat, no carbs. And I think my energy levels were really low because of it. That's a whole other thing. But when I went plant-based and I started eating more of these carbohydrates because I learned that our bodies run on carbohydrates, including your brain, which consumes 25% of the carbohydrates, the glucose you're eating. Yep. Um, the first week that I went plant-based, I had to run twice a day because I was so unused to having that much energy. Mm. I felt more clear-headed. I felt just ecstatic about life. It's like I was filled up with life force energy again. Mm -hmm. So it's just amazing that, I mean, we can talk about the health benefits all we want, but even the emotional benefits of actually feeding your body what it uses for fuel and medicine, it's revolutionary it's the uh, it's the medicine it's the nutrients yes it's everything it is and it is something that you can easily make the switch to do where yeah. one week you try it maybe you won't feel any different but if you do that's worth noting absolutely so with your instagram plant forward sabrina yeah can you share how you decided on that name mm. and that mission why plant forward walk yeah. us through that so i worked in marketing and i was like oh branding's important I don't know if I am good at it, but I know that it's important. So I know that a good name is important. I wanted there to be something with my name since that's not going away. And I wanted it to be about the food that I was making. And like I have said on this podcast, I do not want to force people into being vegan. I do not want to like force them into being plant-based. I cook 90% plant-based. When I have friends come over, sometimes I add some cheese to a dish so that maybe they'll like it more if they're not used to a plant-based cheese or right. maybe I I mean I think cheese is like the mostly what I do but right. I get away with everything else but it's yeah. like I mostly make things vegan but on the occasion where maybe I want to add an egg to something yeah I think that's okay to do that in absolutely life. and so it's keeping a balance to life which you know is super important to me whether it's in my career in my work and playing pickleball still whether it's being able to call you and go for a walk on the same day that I'm filming something or yeah. whether it's in the food that I'm eating and if I want to have have a croissant in France that has butter in it I of course am going to do that absolutely so plant forward came from the idea that you don't need to 100% commit and feel like you are in this box that you can't get out of yeah. why don't you try these recipes if you like them great maybe not all of them will be 100% plant-based maybe mm-hmm. there will be vegans out there that do not like that however I feel like for me it's the perfect way of living my life Absolutely. And I think because you're doing it in a way that's so authentic to you and truly what your values are, that you don't have to go 100%. It's about that balance. Yeah. The right people will resonate with that message. Yeah. And I feel like even for myself, I have changed so much in my thinking through Mm. my plant-based journey because when I went vegan, I mean, I went vegan overnight, literally cold turkey. And that's just my personality. I am... Yeah. Really good at the extremes. Yeah. Which is why I love 
the balance you bring to your life and therefore tried to imbue <laughs> into mine. Absolutely. And when I went vegan, going completely cold turkey, because it was almost easy for me and it wasn't easy. I mean, everyone was against me. My family thought I was crazy. Friends thought I was nutso. And I had days where I was like, I don't even know if I'm doing this right. But because I had the ability to just cut it cold turkey, I was confused that other people weren't like that. <laughs> and I feel like that's not something, crazy. Yeah. I feel like that's just in general, something that we learn as adults that, oh, we are all different mm -hmm. and we all have different values and we have different ways of absorbing information, integrating that into our lives. And so through my journey, I am now at a place where I believe in the plant forward mission mm -hmm. that when you educate yourself and you actually evaluate your your values and, and what you've just read and learned, decide for yourself what works for you and what doesn't. Yeah. You know, add a few more plates to your or plants to your plate mm -hmm. and um yeah, just do little bits yeah. going in the right direction that feels in alignment for you. Yeah. And so I, I'm here for the plant forward mission. Thank you. Yeah. I think you're getting at the best part, which is like, you're not going to stick to something if you don't fully believe it or you're not buying into it yourself. So like yeah. I know myself and if I were in Italy and one of my friends got gelato and I was fully plant-based and yeah. I wouldn't be able to get it because they had no sor sorbet there or something, I would be upset and I would be like, I'm not living life to the fullest. And I think yes. that's like the playful, fun, adventurous, the magic in going to an ice cream shop, literally. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that is a crucial part of my life that I want to make sure that people know you don't need to 100% be this Absolutely. in order to be healthy or considered plant-based. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, in this room, we are anti-labels, anti-rules, color outside the lines, fun, fun, <laughs> joy, balance, cool. cool. <laughs> Let's just keep going. Let's this keep is going, going well. But so much we could say about the plant-based life yeah. and your Instagram journey, but I feel like we've covered a lot of territory. Yeah, I so, so I want to bring it to the rapid fire questions. I love it. But before we go there, I just want to ask if there's anything else on your heart or your mind that we haven't touched on that you want to share. No, this is, this has been great. I feel like the quick tidbit of yeah. plant-based eating of like a fun activity, if you're okay. trying to go plant-based or eat more plants. Yeah. So this is something that I learned in the class that you and I took and it's try to have 30 different varieties of plants a week and that can be anything from different vegetables so broccoli green beans that's two already to yeah. your nuts and legumes you have walnuts pecans and then let's say garbanzo beans and kidney beans and something mm -hmm. else so try to count all 30 in a week and get 30 different sources because each one has different micronutrients and things that they will add to your body and yes. the medicine that you need and so a fun activity that Peter and I did when I was just starting to go plant bases, we would count in all of our meals to I get to that 30. That. And it was way easier than we thought to get to 30 in a week. Wow. So just take that as a little piece of fun activity to add if you're That's trying to go a little more plant so forward. So classic you to have the fun activity. <laughs> I no, I truly love that tidbit because they say the more variety of plant foods in your diet, the healthier your microbiome, which we already talked about. It's huge. So of course we got to turn it fun if Sabrina's it's a game. on the podcast. It's always, it's always a, game. a game. Okay. And now we have the rapid fire. Okay, question rapid fire. So there are four questions. The first one Easy. is always personalized for the guests. Oh, love it. So because you're apparently into food and all that, I wanted to ask what your favorite cuisine meal or recipe is at this point in time. What are you currently obsessed with? I always have been obsessed with Mediterranean food. Yeah. It is the flavors of a shawarma type dish oh. with the creaminess of a tzatziki oh. in there and the crispness of a fry in a pita euro. Oh, oh I'm And now salivating. I make it I, I make it with shredded tofu now and it's the best thing ever. That's a great idea. I should have made that. For, we can maybe make it this week. Ma oh, this week. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Also, if anyone wants your recipes, I highly recommend yeah. they check out Plant Forward Sabrina on Instagram. There it is. What there a plug. It is. This There's is the whole the reason plug. I'm on here. Absolutely. Just kidding. Yeah. Okay. Second question is, what is your favorite health or spiritual practice that you do that you would recommend for everyone? It's just that awesome. Um, 
walking daily is always great. I think that that's like a really basic one. It makes you feel more grounded and connected. So it's spiritual in that way. Yeah. It's healthy because you're getting outside. And then if you do it with a friend or you call a friend or a parent or somebody else while you're doing it, you kind of get that emotional attachment as well, which is spiritual in ways. So walking. And then if you don't like walking yoga, do something at your home. I love that. Okay, so both are very, like, move your body. Move your body. Yeah. Do it. Move it. That's great. Do, do it and move it. Just do it. Just move it. <laughs> no, I like that a lot. Just move it. That's the tagline for this That's episode. That's the tagline. Now. There it is. Absolutely. Okay, so question number three. What does the world need most for global healing and up-leveling at this point in time? Mm. There's a lot about compassion that jumped to my mind right away. It's like that being a kind person and just being open-minded. I think actually, you know, open-mindedness. I think the world needs more (laughs) open-mindedness. Maybe that's not open-minded of me to say. (laughs) No, it (laughs) is. But I, I think that just hearing the other person hearing them you don't need to agree with it but like treating them with respect and being open-minded to what they're saying instead of completely closed off I think that can help a lot of the healing and the conflict because I don't think that people are even listening these days absolutely and I feel like that has been honestly a common thread or theme throughout today's conversation Mm -hmm. talking about the differences in spiritual beliefs or eating patterns and that at the end of the day we all have much more in common than we don't and just listen, ask questions, be curious, yeah. and you'll find out that there's so much common ground. Exactly. Okay. Last question. What is your one wish or ask for everyone listening today? Ooh, for everyone listening. Uh, do something that you find fun in the next 24 hours. You oh. just, just be inspired to do one thing that is either like for your childhood self that you find spontaneous on the street. Maybe it's calling up a friend. Maybe it's sending them that text that says that they're great. You're grateful for them. Yeah. Whatever to do something that like will make your heart smile. Oh my gosh. That makes me want to cry. I don't know why. <laughs> and we're going to have to do it then the next 24 hours. Absolutely. So there are so many takeaways from today's episode. We have do something fun. Send that. I'm thinking of you text message. You're my role model text message. Yeah. Um, Pick up a phone and call a friend on a walk. Yeah. Only eat plant-based ever. (laughs) Yeah. That's the message. (laughs) message. Count your plants. See how many you can eat in a week. Mm -hmm. What are some other nuggets Um, that we had from today? About, you know, friendships and relationships. Don't put pressure on the amount of communication you have with someone. Yeah. The open-mindedness, I think, comes to mind as well. And treat people with kindness and respect. Absolutely. These seem really basic. It feels like we're... But they're so important. (laughs) I would say maybe the last one is following those intuitive breadcrumbs. I like that. And knowing that they won't lead you astray. Yeah. I I like that. Okay. So we'll end there. Um, Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for coming over. And for everyone listening out there, we will see you next week. (laughs) She will. I will not. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Hey, my friends. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you couldn't tell between the laughs, the chuckles, the giggles, I had an absolute blast talking to Sabrina, but I also took so many nuggets of wisdom away from the conversation. She inspires me each and every day to be more spontaneous, more present, enjoy the small things in life, find more joy in the everyday, and most importantly, find a little bit more balance which is something that I can often struggle with. So I hope that you too had a few nuggets of wisdom that really resonated. And if they did, please share that with a friend or family member and we can share some of the wisdom and the joy of Sabrina Kinney. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share this show with a friend or family member. I'm really aimed at creating this community of like-minded souls people that want to spread more love and light and good in the world. And by sharing this episode with a friend or family member who might get something important out of it, you will have done just that. You will have just spread a little bit more love, light, and good. Okay, friends, I already cannot wait to see you again next week. Until then, bye for now.